tonight the renowned psychiatrist and best-selling author Professor Steve Peters, a man who has helped multiple British athletes achieve gold and win trophies. This is a guy who's worked with, among others, Stephen Gerrard and the Liverpool football team, Sir Chris Hoy, Ronnie O'Sullivan, Victoria Pendleton, and they've all spoken publicly about how Professor Peters' unique mind management model has helped them to improve their performance and achieve extraordinary success. Uh, here's the first book, and it was called The Chimp Paradox. Uh, the quote on the front, uh, Steve Peters is a fresh voice, a new mind, number one international best-selling author. Uh, the inspiring message of The Chimp Paradox has helped millions of ordinary people around the world too to successfully manage their emotions, achieve their full potential, and break bad habits they thought they'd never get rid of. Well, his latest is out now. It's bigger, longer, heavier, and better. It's called A Path Through the Jungle, a psychological health and well-being program to develop robustness and resilience. Professor Steve, Steve Peters, welcome to the show. Welcome to GB News. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, developing robustness and resilience feels very timely after a two-year-long pandemic, doesn't it? Yeah, very much. So what, what inspired the, uh, the new volume based around your, your chimp philosophy? When I wrote the first one, I was trying to get the concept out there that we could explain the neuroscience of our mind and give an understanding of why we have our behaviours or emotions, why we think the way we do, and explain how to manage that so you can actually run your mind the way you want to. So that's why I put out there a lot of ideas, a lot of suggestions for people. But fair point, they criticised um, Kim saying, well, you know, I c it's great, but I can't use it to become really robust and resilient. It's not deep enough. So I did it again in the second book to try and say, right, start from the beginning and let's build you up slowly. So I've, I've done this as a true programme. It's got eight stages. You work through each stage. It's like learning a language. You start to understand yourself. And what I was trying to say to people when they say, give us a talk on robustness, it's not so easy because there are a lot of things that contribute to the mind being robust or resilient. But this is my attempt to help people to get there. So lots of ideas on route that hopefully some people will resonate with. What I love about the book is it, it functions as a, a brilliant self-help guide. I'm not going to lie, full disclosure, I read The Chimp Paradox a few years ago. It changed my life, as it has for so many of your readers, because it, it helped me and it helps anyone that's read it to manage your emotions. Because what, what one won't necessarily understand until you've read the book is that it's our emotional brain which seems to dominate our fate. And it's, it's important that we have those emotions uh, somehow uh, to heal and uh, in our own control. So can you tell us, if it's possible, in a, in a sort of slightly succinct way, how your method works? I think I tried to go back in time when I was a young doctor. So you're going back into the 1980s and... You've got patients coming in. I worked in the NHS as a consultant. So in 20 years of there, people you realise come in and they don't have actually mental illness. What they're saying is, I'm in a mess emotionally. I, I just can't manage my own emotions or thinking. And I was trying to explain, well, we don't need medication for that. We need understanding, insights, and then some emotional skills. So, but what struck me probably in the 90s was recognising when we look at the neuroscience and seeing scanners at work, so we now see the brain acting in, in real time, and the functional MRI scanners clearly started showing that we have effectively, I've simplified it, uh, two thinking types of brain, one of which is genetically given to us, um, and we share this brain in the way it thinks with chimpanzees, literally, not the other great apes, such as the gorilla or the orangutan. They don't think the same way. Mm. So chimpanzees and humans think with this, what I called initially the red brain. And then nature gave us a blue brain, which works very differently. And this is an independent thinking um, brain with its own volition. So what you end up with is a clash of interpretation of the world from two separate brains, effectively. And then the centre of the brain was trying to help both of them. So I saw it as almost like an orchestra. Your, your mind is all playing at once. So that's why in a scanner, you, all the areas seem to light up, gets complex. But you start to recognise that actually there's a leader here who's tapping the baton and calling on certain instruments. So you had this innate chimp brain, which is working with an emotional basis, and then you had a separate brain, which develops very slowly in life. It doesn't appear really in any shape or form until you're around three or four year old. And then it starts laying down factual memory and starts working log logically. But that takes up to 30 years to develop. So the emotional innate brain, which we don't have control of, 
thinks and acts is impulsive. It, it doesn't see consequence. It has no perspective. So it, it tends to lead as a merry dance, and it can actually destroy people's lives. And this was the dawning moment for me in the 90s. Could we actually teach people to manage that? So I was doing it with people that came to the doors who were classed as patients, which I saw really just people in difficulties. Uh, and I started to be able to teach them these skills. So I was really keen to see, could they teach them themselves? And that's when I realised if they actually understood that they're fighting something which they don't need to fight, they need to understand and work with it. Understand, for example, when we get a, a negative emotion, as I've tried to explain in the book, mm. this is the brain's way of saying, you need to come up with an action and a solution. Don't engage the negative emotion. So what I found the people who were coming in were doing was engaging anxiety or engaging fear or anger and then seeing that as a problem instead of a message. And your brilliant book, both books, I mean, you know, your, your knowledge of, uh, of the human brain is, is capacious and will never get close to your, your knowledge or understanding. But to make it accessible to readers and also as a functional you know, set of tools with which to, to, to be the person you want to be, mm. you have simplified it. And, and that's why it's an international bestseller. And you've essentially imparted the information that we need to get better, to be who we want to be. And if I'm right, my memory serves me that you essentially divide the brain into three key areas, which would be uh, the memory bank. That's like a, it's basically a sort of hard drive. And that's just onto which everything that happens to you in your life just gets stored. And that's not an opinion. And it's just you get stung by a bee, that hurt, and it goes into your, your memory drive. Yeah, and when you do that, it's important mm. to know there's two memories get laid down. Mm. So you have a memory of the factual information a bee stung me, but you have an emotional memory, which doesn't work with facts, just feelings to say I associate emotion with a certain event now. And so actually we find in people who have illness, for example, that one of those might fail. So they might see a bee and have no understanding why they're getting hysterical. Uh, and again, many of us experience that when our brain just deletes the factual memory. And others who see a bee and say, I know this could sting me and don't seem to have an emotional reaction. So we can see that. And so unfortunately, it's by looking at people who are ill, you work out what the brain is doing. And then apply it to people who are not ill and say, well, hang on, if you start to recognise this, you start to divide your memory up and start seeing which bit's useful. And both of them are useful. And so what you can do is you can jump into that hard drive, that data bank, and you can rewrite some of, of exactly. the content and, and take exactly. out some of the stuff that's, that's unhelpful or not authentic or just based on an impression or a fear um, and then leave the useful stuff in, such as bees sting. Yeah, and to it make it simple, helpful. I think... Uh, what I was trying to say to people, mm. when I try an analysis and say to someone, let's discover what's in your head, because I don't sit there with them lying on a couch. We work together at the table and we explore their mind. And my average guess would be that uh, six really faulty beliefs, destructive beliefs, are what are inside most people's heads. So I call these the gremlins. They're messing up the computer. And often we don't know what they are. And so when you discover these gremlins, you can remove them. And that can make a difference in the way you perceive yourself, the world, other people. So it can transform people and say, this is so different now. So we have some strong gremlins at times, like having low self-esteem, and it's based on a belief which has really come from a long way back. And, and, and could, it, could, could it be some false fact about yourself that you've sort of thought is true, like um, I'm, not, I'm not an outdoorsy type or I can't do public speaking, and the way that we label ourselves in that way, is, is that some of the negative stuff that can go onto the hard drive? Yeah, and you get some quite severe ones, like I'm not as good as everybody else, and mm. you may not even actually know you, you've got that belief until you start exploring it, and then it starts to dawn you. That's why you're losing in confidence that's where you don't do public speaking that's why or you might have a belief that people are, are really going to be critical of me mm. um, and then you generalize that to everybody who are, I tried to explain that research indicates one in five people will love you however you present you know they love everybody and one in five people are going to criticize you whoever you are so once you start working with that you start to recognize you can distinguish between someone who's not going to be very helpful and someone who's always helpful and a middle group who are going to be fair with you so we've covered the hard drive then we've got the other chunk which is the part that you you help us to, to become the dominant part which is our true selves our sort of true essence our personality and that's the person we want to be. There's one exercise in the book. I think it's, uh, I can't remember how it goes, but it's, it's essentially to write down... A blank piece of paper. What was it? Yeah, and what was it? Write down all the things that... The you, perfect you. I think the perfect what struck you. me is if you think about it, and being simplistic, if we were to surgically remove what I'm classifying as the chimp system and surgically remove the centre computer system, mm. that's two of the systems, you're left with just yourself, and now you have complete control. So you would choose your emotions. So if anxiety appeared, you'd say, well, that's not very helpful, I won't have that. 
And that's what would happen in the brain. So when I ask people to write on the perfect you, and it is an epiphany moment, that is you. So if you say to me, the perfect me would be calm, compassionate, great friend, confident, you're describing yourself. And then people say, but that isn't what I'm like. I'm not calm. So the I'm perfect you tends to be what your true essence could it be. It is you. It is, it you. is you. Wow. It's not me. It is you. Mm. What we're saying then, people say, well, I'm not calm. And I'm saying that's because there's interference coming in. So the chimp then interferes, the chimp brain interferes, the computer interferes, and it presents to the world a different picture to you. Yeah. So we've covered that. That's your true essence, your true personality. We've got the data bank, and then we've got the key one, the star of the show, the chimp paradox. Uh, this is the cheeky little monkey that lives in your head. It's not necessarily your best friend, but also not necessarily your worst enemy. But this chimp, this random character that you've inherited, needs to be trained. It needs to follow your commands. Is that right? I wouldn't say commands. I mean, you wouldn't command a friend. I, mm. I think the, the chimp brain is, is our best friend. The paradox is really that we don't recognise it such. I mean, I describe my chimp brain as being my best friend, but he's inept. You know, he doesn't know how to handle things. Well, yeah, so tell things. us about this chimp. What is, what is this chimp in our head? Uh, what, what, what does it do? How does it behave? OK, let yeah. me give it a simple one, because, again, I usually go to food because many of us struggle with food. We all know what to eat, we all know how much to eat, but we don't. So at the beginning of the day, many times you'll say that today's going to be a good day. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you say today was another disaster. And you sit there thinking, how can this be possible? It's me that puts the food in my mouth. So if you now scan the brain, let's see simplistically what's happening. So I go out for a meal and I decide to eat something very healthy. But as soon as I get the menu, my, my chimp brain says, no, we want something that's immediate gratification. And now it starts to think. It doesn't just have impulsive drives and in an instinct. It thinks and it rationalises and fools me. It says, you know, you're allowed to have pizza with extra topping because tomorrow you can go on the treadmill and do it extra. And that's really healthy. And you deserve a treat. So it fools me into thinking that a treat is food and that I'll actually get on the treadmill tomorrow, which isn't going to happen. So sometimes the monkey, if, if sort of out of control in your head, can lead you to make these bad decisions. Uh, it can be a negative force. So the monkey might be the one that says, look, you've got a job interview tomorrow, but let's go out with your mates and get smashed. Or exactly. Could, but could it... the monkey be the one that says, uh, you're married, but why don't, you, uh, why don't you go and have a romantic clinch with Sandra from accounts? Is, is the chimp responsible for these things or a cheesecake at midnight? Some people. I think it's careful because it's not mm. a blame model. It's not an right. excuse model. Mm. You're absolutely 100% responsible. I'm a great dog lover and my dogs at home are well behaved sometimes. But if one of them came and bit you, I can't just say, well, that was my dog. I'm 100% responsible. So you can't just blame this emotionally based brain and say, well, it shouted at you or it ordered pizza or it had an affair. I don't think that's reasonable. Uh, so it's not an excuse. What I'm saying is let's understand why it's doing that or trying to do that and let's rationalise things which it can't do, like the consequence. So even going back to the pizza, if I sit down and say, me, let me think twice, let me just have my thoughts, your thoughts are immediate gratification, which it's trying to say we don't know when the next bit of food is and also we need pleasure. So if I now say, OK, we need pleasure, but let's have pleasure in being proud of what we do rather than what we eat. Uh, so I might change the, the way we have pleasure, but also I'll think of consequence. This brain can't think of consequence. So when we use this brain, which is not a bad thing, but it can be if it's impulsive and doesn't think things through. So it's like being with a partner who you say you love, and if we put a video on, you see you shouting at them or being really irritated with them or, you know, you're not um, tolerant. And you think, is that what you want? The answer is, no, I don't. So why is it happening? And if we scan the brain, this part of the brain is trying to say, well, if they shout at me, I shout back. That's reasonable. It may be reasonable, but actually it's not helpful. And so if you stop the person at that point and said, you know, you really love this person, what do you really want? And you'd probably say, I'd like to just go back to being me who's calm and collected, get some perspective and say, this is not going to be kind to shout back. It's not what I want to do, so that's not what's going to happen. And this is where it gets a little complicated. I've done it hopefully simply. Yeah. You've got a chimp and a human in this fight. The computer now comes to the rescue. And it's what we and that's put the in data that, bank. That's, with, that's yeah. the data bank. Because your beliefs now are what you need to get in there. Because mm -hmm. the magic of the brain, which is, I think is fantastic, it gives us an outlet. So when the chimp and human fight, this is what happens in real terms. Within a fifth of a second, information goes to the chimp and knocks us out. And it can do that with multiple hormones and transmitters to stop us. 
So when I say no for the pizza, the chimp just knocks me out. So now it's got free reign to order the pizza. However, the second thing it must do, it must turn to the computer and say, any advice, anything you need to tell me, because I'm not going to move till you answer, and it can't move. So the computer then must feed back what's in it. Now, if I've programmed it, the computer might say something like, which I've had with a, a guy who's working recently, um, his little daughter had cried and said, Daddy, please don't eat too much. He was overweight because we've been told at school it's bad for you and you die. I don't want you to die. And it really affected him. So this has to resonate with a person. Hit, and we put in his computer, next time you go to eat your food, think, which is the most important, my daughter's happiness or my food? Now, that may not work for people. It worked for him. So it is a unique thing. And what you do is you create, you cr create your own... You create your own... Um, like your own rewards. You, what, what do you call them? Autopilots. Autopilots. These oh, are yeah. the You talk about really this early in the book, stop actually. Stop the chimp in its tracks. So what happened with him is he goes to Audrey's pizza, he knocks out his human who's saying, don't do this, mm -hmm. but then the computer comes to the rescue by saying, you know, daughter or food. And if, if it resonates with him and he's rehearsed, then the computer will... Stop the chimp so, and it's trapped. So, we, do you, have you got time? We're going to take a break and, and we'd yeah, love yeah. to carry on this conversation, if that's possible, with my panel. Thank We're you. We're fascinated by what you're doing. Uh, very briefly, if we can, just finishing on the chimp, because it's central to it. Essentially, then, the chimp is, speaking in very crude terms, it is our emotional brain, in a sense. It's this separate little character that's in our head. It's not who we are. It's emotionally based. Emotionally based. It's still emotion. Mm. So it's not logic and emotion. And it's an alien creature, because it's not us, is it? It's a, it's a character that's it's just landed in your head. Exactly. It's a personality in which we see in research starts at eight weeks into fetal life. Uh, and at eight weeks, babies start to and have we, this we, genetic We can't reaction. kill it, and we don't want to. No, you don't want to kill but, it. But because sometimes it'll give us the chutzpah to go and say to the boss, can I have a pay rise? That's what, I mean, because they've said, anyone I've worked yeah. said permission. And Vicky Pendleton said that to me one day. She said, how do I murder the chimp? Uh, and, and I keep saying, you don't want it, you want the best friend you've got. But also, because the thing is, when, when, when harnessed, the powers of the chimp, so he, 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 he or she can be the one that, that gets you to eat the pizza or, or have a liaison with Sandra from sales. It can or, or also Alan, be the one Alan stops you eating the pizza. Well, well that's it. And, and then what happens is that if you get the chimp on board with, no, we're on a diet because we've got Ibiza in three months, yeah. suddenly the, the chimp's like, oh, yeah, I want to be stick thin. I want yeah. those abs. And you motivate the chimp and he becomes your best friend, right? He gets yes. on board with it. So I think that's uh, it's, it's very, very ingenious. And uh, just briefly, the, the idea, the, the key point of the book is that We've got to negotiate with and live with this chimp and have a good relationship with the chimp, nurture the chimp, make yes. the chimp comfortable and happy yes. by, by, with his authentic, um, you know, in, uh, engagement. Yes. Um, the reason why we've got to do that is because not only can we not get rid of the chimp, but the chimp receives all information first in, right. for human beings. So, yes. so if, if I say to somebody, um, I don't like your hair or something, the chimp reacts first. So tell me about that, why the chimp has the first call on everything that happens to a human being. It's the survival system. And so if you... I'll take a dramatic example. Hmm. If you met with someone which would be horrendous, who had a knife in their hand, the chimp will make a very fast decision because it knows to either get out of this or fight them back or freeze. It will make a decision quickly for you, and its intu intuition is very powerful. Whereas if we're going to the human brain, it will be very slow to think, and it will try and rationalise. Now, if I do this, if I... It's too late. So the chimp's... Natural fast reaction is a survival, and it does warn us about people. It warns us about situations. It's that almost in an intuitive voice that comes and says, "This doesn't feel good," and that's the chimp brain recognizing, along with the computer, there's something you need to watch out for here. And we can't work that out. Our human brain cannot do that. We can only work with information. And, and, and every factual. encounter, every exchange that happens in our life is, is, is received first by the chimp. It's the first by the chimp, and if it wants to move, it blocks us and then listens to the computer and moves. Or if it thinks there's no real danger, it can hand over to us. Mm.